Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. Hello ladies and green beans, welcome back to another Clickhole, where we start with a recommendation or a random article and wind our merry way down the strange path with many forks to some mysterious ending. Sorry for missing another Saturday, that's my bad. I've been very burnt out and quite frankly I just wanted to pass out the last few days, but fear not. There will be a Thanksgiving special this weekend, so don't lose hope on me just yet. With all that said, today we're actually going to start with a suggestion from last week, which came from I Dunno, who suggested the Great Molasses Flood. Now I'm gonna make a confession. I actually don't quite understand what molasses is or are. I I have a strange feeling it's sticky and sweet. But have you ever like seen molasses in a store? Like what is it? I don't actually know. Which is stupid because I feel like everybody but me knows. It's like one of those things you've managed to survive life going through without knowing and one day you're just, you're, you're found out. So I'm actually excited for this. So um, great suggestion from I don't know. I'm definitely gonna learn something today. Here we are. Great Molasses Flood, also known as the Boston Molasses Disaster or the Great Boston Molasses Flood, occurred on January 15th in 1919. A large storage tank filled with 2.3 million gallons, weighing approximately 13 short tons of molasses, burst, and the resultant wave of molasses rushed through the streets at an estimated 35 miles per hour, killing 21 and injuring 150. So what the heck is molasses? Molasses or black treacle is a viscous product resulting from refining sugar cane or sugar beets into sugar. So it's basically a sugar goop primarily used for sweetening and flavoring foods in the US, Canada and elsewhere. I've never seen it. I, I do you buy it in a shop? Do you make it? I don't know anybody who's eaten molasses. I have I have no clue what that is. Very strange. What's wrong with actual sugar? I don't know. Anyway, here's a picture. Let's check it out. That is a very sticky mess. God, it really ripped all these buildings down. Look at all this wreckage. Oh, look at the little ambulance. You can see it right here. God, I feel like that's a really narrow vehicle. God, they do look narrow, these cars. I suppose you could fit a driver and that was it. There wasn't like a passenger in the front row. The event entered local folklore and residents claimed for decades afterwards that the area still smelled of molasses on hot summer days. The disaster occurred at the Purity Distilling Company. Molasses can be fermented to produce ethanol, the active ingredient in alcoholic beverages and a key component in munitions. So Purity used that tank that blew up to offload molasses from ships and store it for later transfer via pipeline to an ethanol plant. So it was very cold January, but the temperature rose rapidly. And the day previous to the disaster, a ship delivered a fresh load and they warmed it to reduce its viscosity so it was a bit more liquid and easy to transfer. Because of the thermal expansion and the changes in the temperature of the cold, older molasses inside, the tank burst open and collapsed. Witnesses reported that they felt the ground shake and heard a roar similar to the passing of an elevated train. The density of molasses is about 40% more dense than water, so it has a great deal of potential energy. The collapse translated this energy into a wave, 25 feet high at its peak, moving at 35 miles an hour. That is like a small tsunami just barreling through town. Okay, so this is, oh, but the flood area wasn't that big. So here's a map of Boston occurred somewhere around here and it was just this ring. I mean, I guess that is still pretty significant, all things considered. Nearby buildings were swept off of their foundations and crushed. Several blocks were flooded to a depth of two to three feet. Ooh, here's another picture of the aftermath. That is intense. How do you clean that up? I could barely clean gum off my shoe, let alone a city's worth of molasses. That's insane. So he had 116 cadets from a nearby training ship who waded into the knee-deep mess to pull out survivors. Everybody worked through the night getting people out. And then, in good American fashion, local residents brought a class action lawsuit against the US Industrial Alcohol Company, which owned Purity Distilling. It was one of the first class action suits in Massachusetts and is considered a milestone in paving the way for modern corporate regulation. Naturally, the company claimed that the tank had been blown up by anarchists. <laughs> Of course they did. Yes, blame it on the little people every single time. But they ultimately paid out 628,000 in damages, which adjusted for inflation is roughly 9.26 million. Ooh, cleanup. Uh, cleanup crews used salt water from a fireboat to wash away the molasses and sand to absorb it. 
Everything that a Bostonian touched was sticky. Yes, I imagine. I really don't know how you clean this up. Oh, there's the fateful tank. And of course it's made its mark on culture, which yeah, I feel like that's why I've heard about it, but I had no clue what molasses was, is, are. Oh, is that plural? I have no idea. I'm an idiot. I mean, I kind of want to click on molasses, but I feel like it's going to be really boring. I'll look it up later. Let's move on. There were some interesting things under the Seymour. Honolulu molasses spill. Looks like they've also had some trouble in that department. Otherwise, there's the London beer flood, which was an accident at a brewery. Or there's the Pepsi fruit juice flood. I'm kind of into the Pepsi juice, the <laughs> Pepsi fruit juice flood. Oh, that was quite recent too. Let's do that. Here we go. The Pepsi fruit juice flood was a flood of 176,000 barrels, 28 million liters or 7.4 million gallons of fruit and vegetable juices into the streets of Lebedian, Russia and the Don River caused by the collapse of a PepsiCo warehouse. Yikes. Now, so it was the roof collapse that caused this disaster. Apparently there was no environmental damage done by the spill. That's extraordinary. Do we trust that information? Seems like something they'd want, to, they'd want to say. Oh yeah, no, it didn't do any environmental damage. It was actually all fine. PepsiCo apologized for the incident, offered to pay for all damages caused, and stated that they were working with local officials to determine the cause of the collapse. Well, I think they assessed that. It was the roof. Oh, but that's it. Oh, there's a video. We have to watch it. Look at all that fruit juice. Wow, that actually looks like a legit river. Is this person in a car? Oh yeah, they're in a car. That's their foot. I want to see another picture of it. Pepsi fruit juice flood. Oh dang, that is unfortunate. There it is, what a mess. Well, while we're at it, we might as well also check out the London beer flood. Okay, this took place in 1814 and it happened when one of the wooden vats of fermenting porter burst. Pressure of the escaping liquid dislodged the valve of another vessel and destroyed several large barrels. Somewhere between 154,000 to 388,000 gallons of beer were released in total. Did everybody just come out their doors with pitchers trying to catch any free beer? Oh no, it swept into an area of slum dwellings. Eight people were killed. Five of the mourners at a wake being held by an Irish family for a two-year-old boy. Oh no, this is a disaster. The brewery was nearly bankrupted by the event. The brewing industry gradually stopped using large wooden vats after the incident. So the storehouse clerk noticed in the afternoon that one of the iron bands around a vat had slipped, but he wasn't concerned because it happened a few times a year. So he told his supervisor about the problem and the supervisor thought, oh, nothing will happen, it'll be fine. So the clerk wrote a note to have to one of the partners in the brewery to have it fixed. But an hour after the hoop fell off, the clerk was handing the note to Mr. Young, or holding the note to Mr. Young, when the vessel burst. The force of the liquid destroyed the rear wall of the brewery. Some of the bricks from the back wall were knocked upwards and fell onto the roofs of the houses in nearby Great Russell Street. Stories later arose of hundreds of people collecting the beer, mass drunkenness and death from alcohol poisoning a few days later. The brewing historian Martin Cornell states that newspapers of the time made no reference to the revelry or of the later death. Instead, the newspapers reported that the crowds were well behaved. Maybe not to encourage others to join in. Cornell points out that the popular press of the time did not like the immigrant Irish population that lived in St. Giles, so if there had been any misbehaviour, it would have been reported. That's true, they would have leapt at the chance to castigate the Irish, but they didn't. The area surrounding the rear of the brewery showed a scene of desolation that presents a most awful and terrific appearance, equal to that which fire or earthquake may be supposed to occasion. All right, we've got to see the third one, Honolulu Molasses. Spill. Oh, this was in 2013, also kind of recent. 1,400 tons of molasses spilled into Honolulu Harbor. It's caused by a faulty pipe. Molasses is an unregulated product. Neither Matson nor government officials had a contingency plan to respond to a spill. That's interesting, since historically we know they happen. Natural currents and weather were expected to eventually dilute and flush the molasses out of the harbour and a nearby lagoon. Divers in the harbour area reported that all sea life in the area was killed by the molasses, which instantly sank to the bottom of the harbour and caused widespread deoxygenation. More than 26,000 fish and members of other marine species suffocated and died. Oh god. Well, thanks I don't know for um, 
the recommendation for the Great Molasses Flood, which took us on this loop around other spills. I think what I've learned about molasses is simply that I have no idea who eats it or uses it. I suppose if it is used to produce alcohol. Still, I don't know. Seems like a bad business. Because when you get a Wikipedia page on your product and it has a little box of details that includes under deaths, all sea life in the area, I just feel like maybe it's not worth it. Well, this is a very short article. You know, maybe I want to know about Matson. We've all seen all the containers and trucks that say Matson, but I wonder if they've got anything interesting in their history. Yes, that is the famed logo. It was founded in 1882. Oh, that's old. Strangely enough, they also acquired the historic Moana Hotel and the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Waikiki in 1932. Why would they do that? Hmm. All right, it was founded by William Matson, of course. He was Swedish, but orphaned during childhood. And he arrived in San Francisco after a trip around Cape Horn in 1867. He worked aboard a family yacht and struck up a friendship with a tycoon, Klaus Spreckels who financed many of Matson's new ships. And in 1882, the three-masted schooner, schooner? Schooner? How do you pronounce that, actually, now that I think about it? I don't know. Emma Claudina ran to the Hawaiian Islands, began carrying merchandise, especially of plantation stores, to the islands and returning with cargoes of sugar. Gradually, it expanded interests at both ends of the line. You know, I have to say, for a company as massive and long-lived as Matson, I do find it suspicious that the Wikipedia page is this short. I expected more information. That's shady. Let's check out Vastra Gotaland County, which I have mispronounced horribly, but we're going to go with it as we do, which is where William Matson was born. Looks like they have a famous rock. Oh no, it's a runestone. Ooh. Well, what's on the runestone? We can't see from here. It's the second largest county in terms of population of Sweden's counties. Okay, well, let's check out the municipality because this is all just very technical. So the municipality he was born in was Lisekil. Very charming, very nice. How many, this is like Russian dolls of Wikipedia pages. Now I'm on the municipality, but we can still actually go directly to the town itself. Interesting. Oh, so it's a little coastal town. Is this in Comic Sans font? Oh my God, it is. Apparently it was a famous bathing location in the 19th century because it has a granite beach and sweet water. Don't know what that means. Kolbada Husut, the cold bathing house, a somewhat exclusive and very popular wooden bathing house, dating from 1847, still stands in operation. God, there's actually a communist party on the municipal council. That's interesting. It sponsors a village in Estonia called whatever this is. Um, I don't even know how to attempt to pronounce that. Let's see if we can find out how that's pronounced. It's a village in Northern Estonia. That's it, that's the whole article. That's all we get to know about it. Okay, we do, we do have to find out how it's pronounced though. I'm not gonna leave this page without knowing how to pronounce this. Pronunciation. No, maybe I'm not going to know. No, nope, we're never going to know. It's going to be a mystery forever. We don't know how to pronounce that. And now we have to get out from here to go somewhere else. Let's just go to Estonia. Estonia actually is like one of the most technologically developed countries. It's got a tiny population. How many people are there? 1.3 million, approximately. Estonia is a developed country with an advanced high income economy that was among the fastest growing in the EU since its entry in 2004. The country ranks very high in the Human Development Index and compares well in measures of economic freedom, civil liberties, education and press freedom. Estonian citizens receive universal healthcare, free education and the longest paid maternity leave in the OECD. One of the world's most digitally advanced societies, in 2005 Estonia became the first state to hold elections over the internet and in 2014 the first state to provide e-residency. So when am I moving in? Exactly. I do want to know about the e-residency thing. Um, is there a section on that, please? No? Let's just go there. I'm curious about it. E-residency of Estonia. The program allows non-Estonians access to Estonian services such as company formation, banking, payment processing, and taxation. The program gives the e-resident a smart card, which they can use to sign documents. The program is aimed towards location-independent entrepreneurs, such as software developers and writers. The first e-resident of Estonia was British journalist Edward Lucas. The first person to apply for and be granted e-residency through the standard process was Hamid Tah Sildust from the United States. So you can apply for it by filling in a form online, scanning in your passport and a photo, 
and giving your reason for applying, which does not strongly affect the outcome of the application. Interestingly enough, applicants who'd been involved in financial misbehaviour such as money laundering would be rejected. Then, successful applicants would be invited to an interview in Tallinn, which is the capital of Estonia, or an Estonian embassy about three months after applying, and would then, if successful, be issued with their card. Certificates of the document are valid for up to five years. After that, if a person wishes to continue using e-services, they have to apply for a new document, and the application will be exactly the same as when they first applied. Oh, that's a bit silly. Okay, so benefits. E-residents have their financial footprint monitored digitally, in a manner stated to be transparent. E-residency itself does not have an effect on income taxation, neither does it establish an income tax liability in Estonia. Okay, e-residency allows company registration, document signing, encrypted document exchange, online banking, tax declaration, and fulfillment of medical prescriptions. But how do you take advantage of that from, like, the country you're in? Interesting. Other services become available as the scheme is expanded. Registering an Estonian business was useful for internet entrepreneurs in emerging markets who don't have access to an online payment provider. It does not give the right to physically enter or reside in Estonia. So essentially the goal in creating this program for Estonia was to increase the number of active enterprises there. The private sector must be able to develop concrete services on the legal and technical platform provided by e-residency while the state would continue developing the legal framework according to the needs of the enterprises. It has also been discussed that e-residency could be used to spread knowledge about Estonian culture online to develop cultural export. Comparison can be drawn between Estonia's e-residency program and Micronations, which accept online citizenship applications. Micronation? Tell me more. Oh, there's a tiny Micronation for you. Micronation is a political entity whose members claim that they belong to an independent nation or sovereign state lacking legal recognition by world governments or major international organizations. Most are geographically very small, but range in size from a single square foot. I'm sorry, there's a micronation that's a single square foot. I hope that's in this. To millions of square miles, such as West Arctica. They are usually the outgrowth of a single individual. One crazy dude comes up with this each time. A micronation expresses a formal and persistent, if unrecognized, claim of sovereignty over some physical territory. Micronations are distinct from true secessionist movements because micronations activities are almost always trivial enough to be ignored <laughs> rather than challenged by the established nations whose territory they claim. That's hysterical. There's a list of micronations. There's even one that's proposed in to be based in outer space. Asgardia, of course. Plans are for the country to be pacifist, have no official language, and to hold a composition, competition to design its flag, insignia, and national anthem, and to become a part of the United Nations. <laughs> Citizens of the Commonwealth of Dracul at their annual Tsar Nicholas II parade in Houston, Texas. That looks like quite the parade. Also, can we just reflect on the size of these men at this end compared to these two guys? Like, these look like giants, and these look like just dudes. Oh, look at all the coins. Kingdom of Orania has an interesting coin. Want to see that up close? That's a nice coin. The rest of them just look like regular coins for the most part. So Sealand is the one I know of the most, and I think most people recognize this. It's just like a sea fort on the coast. But I don't actually know anything about the person who started it. Paddy Roy Bates. Let's check him out. Paddy Roy Bates was a British pirate radio broadcaster and micronationalist who founded the unrecognized Principality of Sealand. He was a major in the British Army during World War II. Oh, he died quite recently, 2012. So he was born in 1921, served in the British Army and was injured quite a lot. And then afterwards he became a fisherman. He moved into broadcasting via pirate radio. So he didn't have a license for his station, that's what that means. In 1965, he ousted the pirate station Radio City staff who occupied Knock John Tower, a Monsal Sea Fort. Using the military equipment that was left on the platform, Bates used an old United States Air Force radio beacon to broadcast his station. He became the first pirate radio station to provide 24-hour entertainment. Wait, what does it mean that he ousted the pirate station Radio City staff? It sounds like he literally occupied and kicked everybody off the platform and then just moved in and did his own thing. Formation of Sealand. So, he got convicted of essentially illegal broadcasting, and he didn't have any money, so they went off the air in 1966. So then he moved his operation to the nearby Ruff's Tower, another fort that was further out. 
but he didn't begin broadcasting again. And then there was an act that came into effect which forbade broadcasting from certain marine structures, which included Bates's platform. So instead, he declared independence and deemed it the Principality of Sealand. Then Ronan O'Rahilly of another pirate radio station, Radio Caroline, along with a small group of men, tried to storm the platform that Bates claimed. Bates and company used petrol bombs and guns to thwart O'Reilly's attempt. Is that O'Reilly actually? Rahilly? Riley? Don't know. As a result of the conflict, the Royal Navy went to Ruff's Tower and were the recipients of warning shots fired by Bates' son Michael when they entered what Bates claimed to be Sealand's territorial waters. They were arrested and charged in British court with weapons charges, but the court threw out the case, claiming that the British court did not have jurisdiction over international affairs as Ruff's Tower lay beyond the territorial waters of Britain. Bates took this as de facto recognition of his country and seven years later issued a constitution flag and national anthem among other things, for the Principality of Sealand. Oh my god, you can totally see why that validated his his little country in his head. That is so funny. Because he couldn't be charged. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. In 1978, a German businessman, Alexander Achenbach, along with other Germans and Dutch, invaded Sealand and took Bates' son Michael hostage. Bates and others then launched a counterattack in the early hours of the morning to recapture the fort. He held the German and Dutch men as prisoners of war. Or, as one had accepted a Sealand passport, he was held and convicted of treason, while the rest were released. Germany then sent a diplomat to Britain to ask for intervention, but Britain claimed they did not have jurisdiction. So Germany then sent a diplomat to Sealand directly to negotiate the release of the prisoner. He was released, and the act of diplomatic negotiation was claimed by Roy Bates to be de facto recognition of Sealand, which Germany has denied. Well, Germany, you did play along with Sealand like it was its own thing. Otherwise, wouldn't they have just called this guy like some rogue terrorist or something? Honestly, Ruff's Tower. Okay, so it was a World War II installation. I feel like Britain owned it. Why were they okay with a guy just being like, I live here now, and not say you can't just live there? And then had they have no jurisdiction over it? I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Interesting legal dilemma, I think. But he ended up retiring and lived in England during his later life, and his son was then in charge of the administration of Sealand as Prince Regent, although he also lived on the British mainland. Paddy Bates suffered from Alzheimer's and passed away. Bates said in a 1980s interview, I might die young or I might die old, but I will never die of boredom. That is true. He actually had to defend what he saw as his nation quite a lot from other pirates to the Germans and the Dutch. He took a military man. That is fascinating. Let's see who else was born in 1921. They seemingly have listed absolutely everyone. Ooh, 1921 beginnings. What's in there? Oh, I see. Okay. Introductions. I'm interested in these lists. Currencies. Ooh, products introduced in 1921. The Laughing Cow. Cheese it Chanel number no. five. Wonder Bread. Heck yeah, Wonder Bread. Does anybody still actually eat that? Brand of bread, originated in the US in 1921, and one of the first to be sold pre-sliced nationwide in 1930. This led to the popular phrase, the greatest thing since sliced bread. No, really? It was Wonder Bread? It was Wonder Bread we have to thank for this phrase? I love the selection of markets it's in. The US, Canada, Mexico, and Pakistan. Like, why those four in particular? Like, US, Canada, Mexico makes sense. I mean, they're all connected, you know. This is a region. But then, Pakistan? Pakistan really loves Wonder Bread? So Wonder Bread began in Indianapolis, following with a blind promotion with ads that only stated a wonder was coming on that date. Brand was named by Vice President for Merchandising Development, Elmer Klein who was inspired by the international balloon race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He was filled with wonder by the scene of hundreds of balloons, creating a kaleidoscope of color, resulting in the iconic red, yellow, and blue balloons featured on the Wonder Bread logo. They drew some circles, and it's iconic. So in the 30s, it began being pre-sliced, a significant milestone for the industry and for American consumers who at first needed reinsurance that Wonder Cut bread would not dry out. Unsliced bread returned for a period during World War II during a steel shortage. How interesting. And then bread slices returned two years later. So in the 40s, Wonder was also the first national bread brand to feature open dating. Ooh, how saucy. 
No, just kidding. Isn't that just like the ex expiration or something? <laughs> yeah, shelf life. As well as nutrition information on its packaging. Wow, that's so ubiquitous now. Okay, so why is it in Pakistan? Wonder Bread is present in Pakistan. It's not a part of the North American chain. Really? Really? I, I couldn't figure that out. Yes, this was very much a mystery that Pakistan was not a part of the North American chain. Okay, this does not explain how it ended up in Pakistan. Who makes it there? Do they have license to make it? It's produced in Mexico by a baking company called Grupo Bimbo, the largest baking company in the world. As with Canadian Wonder Bread, it's not a license. They simply bought the brand and factories in Mexico. Hmm, how interesting. Well, let's, uh, let's end this wondrous click hole here at Wonder. We started off this click hole with a suggestion from, I don't know, with the Great Molasses Flood in Boston, which led us on a non-water flood related adventure through Russia, London, and even to Hawaii. After that, we took a detour to Matson Shipping Company, which led us to some Swedish counties and towns, and ultimately to Estonia, where we explored the notion of e-residency and made our way to micronations. We learned about the miraculous pirate-like defense and occupation of a World War II sea fort, looked at some lists from 1921 for ending on Wonder Bread. If you enjoy this click hole, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. My channel is baby-sized, and it will grow with your love. There really is a video this Saturday. I know you don't believe me at this point, and I don't deserve your trust, but here I am asking for it anyway. Have a joyous Thanksgiving tomorrow. I hope you eat until you are uncomfortably full. Stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.